Good evening. Welcome to Wednesday night's Bible study. I'm just starting and no one's here yet, so you'll have to wait for some people to show up. This music always sounds louder to me than it does to you, I know. Ah, uh, yes, my love, I know my hair. There's not much I can do about it. I need a haircut. Well, we got the Burgesses. We got Mark Frost. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, my internet's not been the same. It might be because of the flooding. I know that when we get a lot of rain, our internet does not do as well as it should. There's the Pangborns. Good evening. All right, so uh, let's see. Wednesday night Bible study. Here we are. And uh, uh, since it is Bible study... I don't know if that's Glenn or Denise, but good evening, Glenn and Denise. Maybe it's both of you. Uh, since it is Wednesday night Bible study, hopefully I'll remember to ask you some questions so that you can do some thinking. I was, I've been um, doing some studying, and one of the things that they were talking about is is getting you to think rather than me giving you all the information. And Unfortunately, with videos, it's it's much more prevalent to give you all the information. You don't have to do anything at all. Uh, I much prefer that you do thinking because that's what you're supposed to be doing, not just me. Uh, some bad news. Uh, the In case you don't know, down at Midland, two dams failed last night. There was flooding uh, on the Titabawassee River. Um, it crested, though, so the good news is it crested uh, a little bit lower than what they were anticipating. It crested at 34.88 feet, uh, so that's three feet lower than what they were anticipating. Uh, it crested at 5 o'clock this evening, but homes washed away, bridges washed away, streets washed away. Uh, so pray for those people down there at Midland. Up here in Oscoda, I haven't heard about any damage or any uh, loss of anything up here in Oscoda, any flooding. Uh, Tawas, there was a couple of bridges washed out last uh, last night or yesterday. So uh, down in Tawas, if you're, if you're heading down that way, be aware that some of the roadways may be closed or washed out. Uh, if you're going down south to Saginaw or further south from there, be aware that parts of 23 were flooded and they may still be closed and you'll have to take alternative routes to get to Highway 75. Um, uh, Ismail called me from Tawas and uh, he was concerned because his family lives on the Tawas River and uh, they're not flooded yet. But, you know, be praying for them. Hey, there's the stormers. Uh, be praying for Ismail and his family. And uh, yes, um, if you need help, we as the church, we're here to help, right? So if you need a place to stay because your place is unsafe or flooded, let us know and we'll see what we can do about that. Uh, if your place is flooded or in danger of being flooded, let us know and we can hum, come and help move the pers your personal belongings, try and save some, some of your personal belongings so that they're not destroyed. And we would be more than willing to help you in that regard. Uh, that's the flooding. Uh, and we're supposed to get more rain. So where's all this water going to go, right? Hopefully we here on the uh, Asaba River, our dams won't flood or, or uh, won't break. And I talked with uh, Bill Burgess, and he said that 
Um, we're at a C rating right now, and an A is a bad rating for, for height, so we should be okay for right now. Uh, other bad news is the COVID has finally made it to Coletta, and it's spreading like crazy through Coletta. And um, um, that doesn't mean that they're sick, uh, but they're testing, and what they're as they're testing, they're finding that lots of the employees of Coletta are not contagious. Listen very carefully. They're not contagious, but they have the antibodies. That means that they've been exposed to the disease, but that doesn't mean they're sick, and it also doesn't mean they're spreading it. It just means that they have the antibodies, and that means they've been exposed to it, and their bodies have reacted to it. So because of that, though, because of that, the count for Iosco County has gone through the roof. We now have 71 uh, con uh, confirmed cases of COVID here in Iosco County. So that's a huge jump from, uh, what was it, 55 earlier this week? Uh, so that's a huge jump. Um, and again, it's mostly because of Coletta. As far as I know, it could be something else, could be something more. But from what I've heard, uh, Coletta has uh, the COVID virus and it's kind of spread through there. Um, and again, I haven't heard that they're sick. I just heard that they have uh, confirmed antibodies through various hangers. There are several hangers that have uh, picked up the um, antibodies. That Again, that doesn't mean they're sick. That doesn't mean they're contagious. And that definitely doesn't mean that they're spreading the disease. It just means that they have been exposed to the disease itself. So take that with a huge grain of salt and uh, we'll see where it goes from there. But the official government website tells us 71 confirmed cases, and we are now up to nine people passing away, nine deaths from this uh, disease. Other news, uh, we just did Willie's birthday drive-by, had about a, a dozen or so cars, maybe a little bit less, but uh, we had uh, the ambulance was there to turn on the siren and lights, and that was pretty exciting. That was fun. So. Uh, we had a good time with that. I have not heard if Dan is still in the hospital. Keep praying for that man um, while he tries to get the infection and his leg to go down and uh, he can return home to be with his bride. I think that's all I've got. Don't panic, people, right? Don't panic. This, this is just, it's unusual. As Jesus says, there will be, there will be famines and disease but it's not the end yet. So don't panic, stay true, stay faithful, and uh, stay with, with Jesus, with God. All right, just so we don't forget, I'm Scott Busich. I preach for the Escoda Church of Christ. This is my phone number, 989-305-2721. You're welcome to call me. You're welcome to text me. Uh, if you're watching via Facebook, uh, you're welcome to send me a message on Facebook. If you've got any questions, comments, you need some help, we're here to, to do all that stuff. I haven't talked to Bill and Mike yet about this. Uh, oh, Dan is home. So you're supposed to say something in chat for me. Dan's home. I didn't see the rest of it. Okay, so May 24th, that's this Sunday coming up. We're talking about uh, worshiping at the building. Bill's got Bible class at 10 a.m. We've got worship at 11, worship again at 6 p.m. Uh, we will do what we can to broadcast on Facebook for those who... Um, can't come and be with us there, but we'll be at the building. Bring your face masks, practice social distancing. Uh, we want to try to minimize exposure, minimize uh, uh, the chances of spreading this disease. All that said, I think those are all my announcements. I don't think I was supposed to announce anything else. Let's have a word of prayer, shall we? Father God, we thank you, Lord, for today. We thank you for blessing us. We thank you for this day for our homes and our jobs. We pray for those down in uh, Tawas who have experienced flooding and loss. We pray for those in Midland and in uh, that area that have definitely lost their homes. We're grateful that no one's lost their lives. Father, we ask that you be with them and be with their efforts to recover. Their whole lives have been turned upside down. We pray that the church in that area would be uh, willing with loving hands to help where they can, Father. Father, we thank you so much for what you've given to us. Our hearts go out to the families of the firefighters over in California. We pray that you'll be with the firefighters as they recover, as they 
go, uh, go through medical treatments. And we pray that the doctors and nurses would be with them. Uh, Father, the, we pray for those that are working with the COVID virus, that you'd keep them safe. And, and again, be with the doctors and nurses and watch over them. Give those who are ill strength to recover. And Father, be with us. Help us to be loving and kind. Help us to direct people's thoughts towards you. Help us to confront sin when it, we can and to show love, grace, and mercy all the time. Father, be with us as we study your word. This is our prayer in your son's name. Amen. All right. Hey, Linda. It's good to see you as well. Um, so here we go. Bible study for tonight is in Exodus. We're in chapter 29, starting in verse 1. We've been looking in the book of Exodus. We've been looking at... Uh, um, just what God has to say to the people. And, and it's important to note as we study the book of Exodus, first of all, remember, it's not chronological. Uh, the book of Exodus is, and in fact, if, if I get there tonight, you'll see that it's definitely not chronological. Uh, but it's, its focus is trying to get us around subjects, trying to get our minds wrapped around subjects and things that we can think about. And, and so as we've been looking here in the last couple of chapters, just before this, we saw the emphasis on uh, elaboration for the Ten Commandments, letting people know, well, this is kind of how this works. This is kind of how that works. Letting people know about loving God and loving your neighbor. From there, we've moved into focusing on how holy God is. And it's, it's I don't think it's understood by us Christians well enough or strongly enough that if you recall the beginning of the book of Exodus, God is showing his we're, we're always talking about how, well, you know, God leads them out of the promised land. We got these 10 plagues and all that. But we have to remember that when God is doing that, he's showing his power. He's showing just how powerful he is. And early in the book of Exodus, as they get out of, out of Egypt and into uh, wandering in the wilderness, they haven't actually started wandering yet. But as they move into the wilderness, even before they leave Egypt, there's this, there's this, business of God's powerful and he's doing these things and yet the people of Israel on the other hand are complaining oh they make us work without giving us straw we have to make as many bricks as we can whine complain moan all of that business and so as as we've been reading we, hopefully you've been seeing and the people complaining about there's no food there's no water wine 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 you brought us out here to die you brought us out here so the Pharaoh and his army can kill us and and God is doing <laughs> things that that we as humans we still can't do to this day I'm Moses you know lift up his hands let's let's spread the Dead Sea apart God's going to send this big wind and it's going to divide the sea and we're going to walk on dry ground and can we even do that as humans and the answer of course is no God is this magnificent powerful God then you got these whiny complaining humans As we move into looking at the Ten Commandments, again, who is God and, and your relationship with God and your relationship with your neighbor and, and how do you treat them and all of that. And then as, as we've been studying, we've been looking at the making of the parts of worship, the parts of the building, the parts of, of, the, of, of coming to worship God. And, and as, as we get into uh, chapter 29... Uh, what I want you to understand is as we look at chapter 29, um, I want you to see how holy God is, how dedicated God is to, uh, oh, I pushed the wrong button, hold on, showing how dedicated God is to, to this is holy. You know, I just led us in prayer, and, and every time I do that, every time, okay, let's bow our heads in prayer. For some people, it's just kind of like, ah, yeah, you know, we're going to do that pray thing again. But we're coming into God's throne room when we do that. And, and what, is, what is our mindset when we step into the holy throne room of God? Chapter 29 here of Exodus, where God is going to dedicate Aaron and his sons to be high priests, the ones who go into his throne room. 
Look at how important it is to God that, that Aaron and his sons be, be pre fully prepared, cleansed, purified, holy, all of that business. Look at what it says in chapter 29. I want to start in verse 1, okay? So, now, this is what you shall do to them to consecrate them that they may serve me as priests. Take one bull of the herd and two rams without blemish and unleavened bread, unleavened cakes mixed with oil and unleavened wafers smeared with oil. You shall make them a fine wheat flour. You shall put them in one basket and bring them in the basket and bring the bull and the two rams. You shall bring Aaron and his sons to the entrance of the tent of meeting and wash them with water. Then you shall take the garments and put on Aaron the coat and the, ro the robe of the ephod and the ephod and the breastplate and the girdle with the skillfully woven band of the ephod. And you shall set the turban on his head and put the holy crown on the turban. You shall take the anointing oil and pour it on his head and anoint him. Then you shall bring his sons and put coats on them. And you shall gird Aaron and his sons with sashes and bind caps on them. And the priesthood shall be theirs by a statute forever. Thus you shall ordain Aaron and his sons sons. Here's, here's where we get to the, the, the bloody part, but wash, purify, clothe with the proper clothing, and that's still not enough. That's just the outward. That's just the, the making them look good part. Now, verse 10, now we're going to deal with the real important stuff. Verse 10, then you shall bring the bull before the tent of meeting, and Aaron and his sons shall lay their hands on the head of the bull. Then you shall kill the bull before the Lord at the entrance of the tent of meeting and shall take part of the blood of the bull and put it on the horns of the altar with your finger and the rest of the blood you shall pour out at the base of the altar. And you shall take all the fat that covers the entrails and the long lobe of the liver and the two kidneys with the fat that is on them and burn them on the altar. But the flesh of the bull and its skin and its dung you shall burn with fire outside the camp. It is a sin offering. So just look at this, this moment here. Aaron and his sons, they've been washed. They've been, they put on this clothing and now they're going to take this uh, blood and, and anoint it with oil. And then they're going to take this bull. They're going to kill the bull. Now, the, laying the hand on is a transference of sin. Aaron and his sons are going to transfer their sin symbolically, of course, to this bull. They're going to lay their hands on the head of the bull. This bull is going to die, not because it's going to be eaten, not because it's a magnificent bull. And it's a bull without blemish. It's going to die because of Aaron and his sons, because of their sins. That's why it's going to die. And, and, and it's a sin offering. It's not just, it's not a fellowship offering. It's not a, 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 a covenant. It is a sin offering. This bull is going to die because of their sins. And um, the blood is going to be poured out. It's going to be poured out at the base. This, this, the blooding, the shedding of blood is atonement for sin. So some of the blood goes on the altar. The rest of the blood goes at the base of the altar. Now the fat, if you'll notice the fat, uh, the liver, the kidneys, what is that about? And the answer is that's the good stuff of the animal. All of that goes to God. It always goes to God. The, for the Jews, that part always goes to God. Burn them on the altar because God always gets the good stuff, the best part of the animal, right? But the flesh, verse 14, everything else all gets burnt outside the camp, burned up. Why burned up? Because it is sin and it can't be in the camp. It is, it is completely worthless. Everything about it is completely useless. And if we understood that concept when it comes to Christianity and sin, we would sin less, hopefully. Knowing that when we sin, what we've done is we've created waste. Throw it away. It's junk. It is completely worthless. And it's really frustrating because uh, when, you're, when you're interacting with people who have no concept of sin, they'll, they'll speak about how they live this sinful lifestyle. And they'll do these things and say, oh, yeah, man, it was so much fun. We had a great time doing that and all this, blah, blah, blah. But the reality is all they're doing is creating waste to throw away. It's, it's a complete waste. 
So, Aaron and his sons, this bull is going to die. Its blood is going to be poured out, and its body is going to be burned outside of the camp because of their sin. Now, that's just taking care of their sin issue. We're not done with the blood. Look at what happens in verse 15. Then you shall take one of the rams, and Aaron and his sons shall lay their hands on the head of the ram. Yeah, more transference of sin. How often do we need to do this? Well, how often do you sin, right? Aaron and his sons shall lay their hands on the head of the ram, and you shall kill the ram and take its blood and throw it against the sides of the altar. Then you shall cut the ram into pieces and wash its entrails in its leg and put them with its pieces in its head and burn the whole ram on the altar. Now, this is different from a sin offering. Remember, the sin offering went outside the camp. It's completely worthless. It is waste. It's thrown outside the camp and burned up outside the camp. Now, this animal, this ram... While it's received the sin of Aaron and his sons, it is a burnt offering. That's a different offering. This is a burnt offering. It is burnt on the altar. And as he says in verse 18, it is a burnt offering to the Lord. It is a pleasing aroma, the food offering to the Lord. Now, again, the whole animal gets burnt up to God. Outside The, the bull gets burnt outside the camp. It's a complete waste. This ram is burnt up on the altar, all of it completely burnt up, but it's not a waste because it is pleasing to God. And it's not the actual aroma of a burning animal that's pleasing to God's mind. It is the obedience of the doing. It is them taking that animal and offering it as a burnt offering because a burnt offering means all that I have is yours. That's what a burnt offering is, because we can't actually literally take all that we have and give it to God. Even if we took all that we had and 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 put it into the offering plate or put it into the temple, we still have ourselves. And and so this is again very symbolic. This is the burnt offering is Aaron and his sons, all that they are lives to God. That's who they live to with the burnt offering. Now that's the burnt offering. We still have the forgiveness of sins through the shedding of blood. We have that with every sacrifice except for the grain offering. We'll get to those. Now, verse 19, remember there's two rams. Verse 19, there's another ram. And look at what happens in verse 19. You shall take the other ram and Aaron and his sons shall lay their hands on the head of the ram. What are they doing? Transference of sins. How many times do we need to do this? Yes. <laughs> yes. You shall take the other ram, and Aaron and his son shall lay their hands on the head of the ram, and you shall kill the ram, and take part of its blood, and put it on the tip of the right ear of Aaron, and on the tips of the right ears of his sons, and on the thumbs of their right hands, and on the great toes of their right feet, and throw the rest of the blood against the sides of the altar. Well, what is that about? That certainly sounds weird, and it is weird to our Western mind. But symbolically, what does it mean? The ear is where we hear, we take in information, and this is where we think about and process our ear. Are we listening to God? The thumb, what's the thumb about? We've got this opposable thumb. What do we do with it? We grip, we hold, we handle things. This is about all that I do, my actions, all that I think about, all that I do, and the big toe, that's all about movement. It's about walking here and there. Everywhere I go, this is a dedication from Aaron and his sons. All that I think about, all that I do, everywhere I go is going to be focused on God. This is for the high priest. This isn't for all of Israel. This is for high priest, right? And, and so this is the if you're going to be going into the throne room of God, if you're going to be standing before God in his holy temple, his holy tabernacle, this is what you've got to go through in order to be in that position. So, uh, right ears of his sons, thumbs of their right ear, right hands, great toes of the right feet, throw the rest of the blood against the sides of the altar. Forgiveness of sins again, right? Verse 21, then you shall take part of the blood that is on the altar and of the anointing oil and sprinkle it on Aaron and his garments and on his sons and his son's garments with him. He and his garments shall be holy and his sons and his son's garments with him. 
whew, this is a lot of work, isn't it? Just to you're holy, you're cleansed, you're dedicated, all of this business. And now becoming a Christian, Jesus has done the blood business. But for us, for becoming Christians, now we're, we're never high priests. Jesus is our high priest. We are priests, and but we're dedicated. We we receive the sprinkled blood of Jesus. We have been washed with Jesus. We've been immersed with Jesus. We've been dedicated to Jesus. And so, as as we do, as we look at these things, this is all symbolic for them, for their high priest. We ourselves, as Christians, first of all, we're not. We are priests, but we're not priests for the Judaic covenant. And Jesus, as our high priest, is not a high priest of the Judaic covenant either. He's from the tribe of Judah. We all as Christians are priests and we serve our God. But what we should be seeing here is, because this is a shadow of the reality, what we should be seeing here is this God takes approaching him very seriously. And we as New Testament Christians, we enter with confidence into the throne room of God. That's the book of Hebrews. But do we prepare ourselves to do that? Are you prepared to do that? Or do you just kind of, oh, we're getting ready to pray. Let's do that. I, I am frustrated sometimes when it's, okay, we're getting ready to pray. And people still, yep, 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 yep. I mean, seriously, we're getting ready to go into the throne room of God. And this, you want to talk about whatever you're talking about? Let's get our minds right. Let's get our hearts right. Let's, let's focus in on the fact that we are about to step into the throne room of the creator of the universe. And what is your sin life like with God? Or do you think he doesn't mind if you come in with, oh God, you know, blah, blah, it's okay. Well, I'm, I'm talking with brother so-and-so over here or sister so-and-so over there. Really? I mean, really? Do you, do you really think that that meets with God's approval? I'm not done. Verse 22. You also shall take the fat from the ram and the fat tail and the fat that covers the entrails and the long lobe of the liver and the two kidneys with the fat that is on them and the right thigh, for it is a ram of ordination, and one loaf of bread and one cake of bread made with oil and one wafer out of the basket of unleavened bread that is before the Lord. You shall put all these on the palms of Aaron and on the palms of his sons and wave them for a wave offering before the Lord. And then you shall take them from their hands and burn them on the altar on top of the burnt offering as a pleasing aroma before the Lord. It is a food offering to the Lord. So we're going to take this. This is the second ram. Remember, it's been killed. We're going to take parts of it, the good parts. We're going to... Uh, Offer those as a wave offering. And, and really, it sounds interesting. Okay, I'm going to, or sometimes your text may say heave offering if you've got an older text. Uh, I'm going to show, I'm going to wave this over here. Woo, I'm going to wave this. What is that about? And the, the truth is, if I have an idol, I'll use one of my wife's uh, owl pepper shakers. If I have an owl, idol, I can I can show my stuff to my idol. Hey, look at look at my offering to my idol, right? I can bring this before my idol and say, "Oh, here we go. Here's my offering to my idol." Now, if I have an idol, I can direct all my attention to this idol. But there is no image for God. So where is he? We Christians, we know he's everywhere, right? And Moses and Aaron and everybody else, they know it as well. And so when they wave this or heave this, their offering here or there or to the various points, what are they doing? This God is for you. This God is for you. Where is God? He is all around us. And this is all yours, God. We offer it to you. And, and the food offering is, remember the burnt offering is all that I am is yours. The food offering is all that I have is yours. See, there's a difference between those two, isn't there? And so it's not just I'm yours, I'm here to serve you, I'm here to work for you, but everything that I have, all that I have 
is yours. I give it to you. That's what this food offering is all about. It's all yours, God. It's not mine. It's yours. So verse 26, you shall take the breast of the ram of uh, Aaron's ordination and wave it for wave offering before the Lord, and it shall be your portion. And you shall consecrate the breast of the wave offering that is waved and the thigh of the priest portion that is contributed from the ram of ordination from what was Aaron's and his sons. It shall be for Aaron and his sons as a perpetual due from the people of Israel, for it is a contribution. It shall be a contribution from the people of Israel from their peace offerings, their contribution to the Lord. Every time someone's got a peace offering, every time someone brings a peace offering, not a burnt sacrifice, not a sin offering, not a food offering, but a peace offering, the priests get a peace as well. And this is, this is a fellowship offering or a peace offering. And what it means is this. We use the term communion. These people are going to sit down and eat a portion of the animal. Part of it's going to be burnt up to God. Part of it's going to be given to the priests and part of it's going to be given to the people. And the people get to eat. They get to eat with their God. I'm having a feast with my God. I'm having a fellowship meal with my God. The priests, they get to eat. We're having a great time. This is a good fellowship with, with all of us. We're communing together. Well, we Christians, we have a communion as well, don't we? We call it Lord's Supper. And although Jesus isn't physically present with us, when we partake of the Lord's Supper, eat the bread, drink the fruit of the vine, Jesus is there with us, and we are communing with our God, with each other, in a fellowship that is so sweet and so precious. And, and sometimes uh, I wish that Lord's Supper took longer not not longer to pass around but longer for us to to spend with each other so i can say uh i'll just pick it in here linda just so i can say linda i'm eating with you you're eating with me this is a great time this is a great moment and on and on it would go you know through the list this is i'm fellowshipping with you you're fellowshipping with me we're fellowshipping with god all right moving on so verse uh, 29, the holy garments of Aaron shall be for his sons after him. They shall be anointed in them and adorned in them. The son who succeeds him as priest who comes into the tent of meeting to minister in the holy place shall wear them seven days. So this isn't just a uh, one day process. This is a seven day process. And uh, again, as we continue, look at verse 39, uh, sorry, the 31. The holy, um, you shall take the ram of ordination and boil its flesh in a holy place. Why the boiling? Because when you boil the meat, the fat comes off. Remember, God gets the good stuff. He gets the fat, right? This is going to come back to haunt uh, Israel because there will be some sons of the high priest who choose not to let God have the fat. They will take the meat before it's boiled. They'll take the meat before it's cooked. And, and the people will say, well, no, no, that's for God. And they'll say, ah, who cares about this God guy, right? God gets the good stuff. It may seem like we get away with shorting God, but the reality is he is paying attention. And those sons will be punished by God for their lack of demeanor towards God. All right, so... Um, Uh, verse 35, thus you shall do to Aaron and to his sons according to all that I've commanded you. Through seven days shall you ordain them. And every day you shall offer a bull as a sin offering for atonement. Um, and shall anoint it to consecrate it. Seven days you shall make atonement for the altar and consecrate it. And the altar shall be most holy. Now this is really interesting. Whatever touches the altar shall become holy. Now, again, there's a big deal about holiness and, and uncleanliness. Things that are holy, usually if things something is holy and uh, it gets touched by an unclean thing, it becomes unclean itself. But here the rule is the opposite. If it's something holy 
and something touches it, then that other thing becomes holy as well. And what is this holy thing? The answer is the altar. Why is the altar the holy thing? Because the altar is where the blood is spilled. The altar is where the sacrifices are offered. The altar is where God is or where he receives the offerings that are given by the people. And again, this is very symbolic because when you go to your New Testament, what do you find with Jesus? He's approached by a leper. The leper says, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus says, I will. He touches him and heals him. The holy thing, Jesus, makes the unholy, the leper, holy, clean. And that's very significant, again, uh, knowing the symbolicness that comes through this. Uh, he's going to talk about uh, some of these, some more offerings, regular burnt offerings, um, regular daily offerings that are to be going on. I don't think it's really necessary to get into those too much. Um, but what I want you to see is, as I read this chapter, is, is here is this holy God and in order just for Aaron and his sons to get there, to come into the throne room of God, they got to go through this whole process. New garments, washed, anointed, uh, sprinkled with blood, uh, and various animals dying. They have to do a sin offering. They got to do a burnt offering. They got to do a, a grain offering or fellowship, a food offering. They got to do a, a, a fellowship offering. All of these offerings just so that they can be consecrated so they can come before God. Now, we as Christians, what do we do? How do we get our start with God? How do we, how do we get that first entrance into the throne room? It's, it's interesting because there's a lot of people in the world that think, well, all I have to do is say I trust Jesus and boom, I got all of the benefits. I got all the access. I got all the rights. Are you sure? Are you sure that's how it works with the Holy God who is so insistent here in the Old Testament that you do this, you do this, you do this, you do this, and God is very holy. So are you sure that's how you want to go down that road? All right. Uh, I'm not going to answer that. I'm, I'm hoping it's a rhetorical question. You can look at, look at it yourself and figure that out. So chapter 30 He's going to talk about making the altar of incense. And the altar of incense is, uh, um, it's different because it burns. Uh, um, it, it burns an aroma, but it, it's supposed to be burning 24-7. Well, from morning to evening, it's supposed to be burning all day. It's supposed to have this, this aroma to God every day because during the day, you can't see the fire, but you can see the smoke. During the night, you can see the fire. During the day, you see the smoke. And, and this is about representing God. Uh, when, when Moses first builds the tabernacle, remember, God's going to lead them through the wilderness. How does he do it? There's a, by day, pillar of smoke. By night, a column of fire, right? And we'll read that later on. This is, again, very symbolic. Why did they have the incense burning all the time? Because the smoke going up shows Israel, God is here, God is here. Fire at night, God is here, right? That's the altar of incense. God is here. Uh, this is who God is. Now, having this focus, hey, Joyce, good to see you. Oh, Stan, sorry. So, so having this focus of holiness, having this focus of, of God being this, this awesome, not just powerful God, because we see that early in the book of Exodus with all the plagues and, and the power that God manifests and shows, but he's a holy God. And so are you ready to be a people of God? Now, we've already had a problem with that because they've, at one point, remember, and again, this isn't chronological, but at one point God speaks and, and the people say, well, we can't stand to hear the voice of God. Moses, you go listen, come back and tell us because if God speaks again, we're going to die. Well, look at what happens here in chapter 30 and verse 11. Yes, uh, cloud by day, pillar of cloud by day, uh, smoke, uh, fire by night. Yes, depends on your translation. Uh, so look at look at verse 11 here in chapter 30. The, the Lord said to Moses, when you take the census of the people of Israel, 
Then each shall give a ransom for his life to the Lord when you number them, that there be no plague among them when you number them. Notice there's twice there. When you number them, when you number them. It doesn't sound like it, but this is actually a voluntary thing. Meaning this. Only the faithful people those who believe, those who trust in God, are going to be numbered. It's not number the people. It is when the people, when you take the census, each of them has to ransom his life. they got to pay back. they got to buy back their life. That's what ransom is about. You have to buy back your life from God when you number them so that there's no plague. For those who don't buy back, for those who don't give their money, what? They don't believe in God. They don't trust in God. All right, so voluntary census. Pay a ransom for your life. Verse 13, each one who is numbered in the census shall give this. Whew, are you ready? Big tax money. Mm. Half a shekel, according to the shekel of the sanctuary. The shekel is 20 geras. Half a shekel is an offering to the Lord. Uh a shekel is a day's wage. Half a day's wage. That's it. <laughs> I don't know about you, but our tax system is so out of whack. Anyway, half a shekel, half a day's wage. Ah, this is, uh, again, this is one of those uh, interesting verses, verse 14. Because um, people talk about the age of accountability. And notice here that God holds uh, people in the Old Testament accountable by age, by physical age. I, I, I don't have any scriptural basis for this specifically, but for the Old Testament, we do have a physical age. When we get to your New Testament, I believe it's more of a mental age. Uh, understanding. But that's for another day, another study. But here it is, 20 years old and upward. Look what he says in verse 14. Everyone who's numbered in the census from 20 years old and upward shall give the Lord's offering. The rich shall give not, uh, not give more, and the poor shall not give less than the half shekel when you give the Lord's offering to make atonement for your lives. You shall take the atonement money from the people of Israel and shall give it for the service of the tent of meeting that it may bring the people of Israel to remembrance before the Lord so as to make atonement for your lives. Half a shekel, doesn't matter if you're rich or poor, half a shekel, half a day's wage, right? 20 years old and upward. So what about those who are 19 and under? God doesn't hold them accountable. They don't have to pay a ransom for their lives. They don't have to pay the, sh the temple tax, the tabernacle tax, census tax. All right, moving on. Uh, oh, well, maybe not, because here we are at quarter till or three quarters after, depending on your point of view. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't think there's anything really much more to be gleaned from the rest of the verses in this chapter. Uh, what I want you to think about, though, is, is this is a holy God. And he goes to great lengths to prepare Aaron and his sons to come before him, to lead the people in worship. And uh, we as Christians, we come before God and, and we're so used to, well, let's pray or let's go to worship. And let's, but um, our God is a holy God. And, and we cannot bring sin in before our God and just kind of parade it around as if it's nothing. Because when you go back and you read chapter 29, a bull is going to die, a ram is going to die, a ram is going to die every day for seven days, just so Aaron and his sons can serve God. Well, we as Christians, we have one blood offering. His name is Jesus. Do we give our best to God? Do we give the fat to God? Do we give all that we are to God, the burnt offering? Do we give all that we have to God, the grain offering? Do we commune with God, the fellowship offering? 
all of these lessons that come out of Exodus, when we get to your New Testament, we talk about us as Christians. We don't talk about these things. We, Jesus is our sacrifice, and away we go. And he is our sacrifice, and that's great. But that doesn't absolve us from responsibility and things that we need to do as Christians. I can't live in a moral lifestyle and just, ah, Jesus covers my sin, no problem. That's, that's not the impression we're supposed to get from this. Now, having said all of that, we get to chapter 31. God's going to anoint a young man by the name of Bezalel to be his architect, to be his master craftsman. We'll see that next week. But that'll be, uh, Lord willing, we'll be at the building, uh, barring some catastrophic uh, COVID virus going wild here in Oscoda. We'll see what happens. Pray for those that are ill. Pray for those over at Coletta. Uh, this has got to be traumatic for them. I've been exposed. I don't know if I've been sharing it with the world. I may be responsible. All these things that those at Coletta have to deal with now that they have the virus. Have I shared it with somebody who can't handle the virus? Did somebody get sick because of me? And on and on it goes. Pray for those people. It's got to be very traumatic for them, very difficult. Um, pray for those at Midland. If you get the opportunity to help them, do so. If you're, again, flooded or in danger of being flooded, let us know. We'll help you as best we can. Uh, we still have our food pantry. If you need food, we got food to share, and we would love to share it. So let me know. Give me a phone call or text me or message me, and we would do what we can to help you out in that regard. If you need groceries and if you don't feel safe to go get groceries, let me know. We've got volunteers from the church who are willing to do that for you, um, and uh, we can express our love that way. But all that, barring some unforeseen circumstance, Lord willing, May 24th, we'll be back to worship at the building, 10 a.m., 11 a.m. for worship, 6 p.m. for worship. You're welcome to join us. I invite you. Uh, we will be broadcasting on Facebook as best we're able to. My name is Scott Busich. I preach for the Escoda Church of Christ. Here's my phone number, 989-305-2721. You're always welcome to call me. Uh, let's have a closing prayer, shall we? Go into the throne room of God. Is our mind right? Is our heart right? Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for the grace you extend to us and the mercy you give us because sometimes we come into your throne room without thinking about it. You are a holy God and you've loved us so much and sometimes we take advantage of that. Help us to be a people who love you and love our neighbors more than we love ourselves. May we see your holiness and may we treat you as the holy God that you are, all powerful. Father, we thank you for your son, Jesus. It's in his name we pray to you. Amen. Let me give you a little bit of music here. And uh, again, Lord willing, we'll see you at the building on Sunday. Stay safe, stay well, God bless.